Hey guys, this is Patrick from STH, and today we're going to talk about the Dell Networking S5148FON. And some of the relevant bits that you need to know about that model name are the fact that it's a Dell EMC switch and it uses their Dell OS 10 for their networking software. So that's kind of cool too. It's also that one in the 51 means that it is their, you know, that's the generation number. 48 means that we get 48 25 gig ethernet ports. And then ON frankly means that it's open networking. Now this switch is not a new switch by any stretch of the imagination. In fact, I think that the switch actually came out in like something like May of 2017. And ever since the switch came out, it's become somewhat of an interesting switch to look at. And that's kind of why I thought, well, maybe I'd go get one, actually two, and go tear them apart. And so we can go look at them and see what makes them tick. The reason that's super important is because some of the hardware choices that Dell made in 2017, which were perfectly reasonable back then, have kind of meant that this switch has a very different spot in the market than when it launched. And I think it may be worth taking a look at these days because it's actually a pretty inexpensive switch. To give you some sense, if you look on something like eBay and you just go search for the Dell S5148FON, what you're probably gonna find is a number of listings, some not even just in the US, but also some inventory in Europe, where you typically will see prices maybe in the $1,300 to $1,600 range on a very regular basis. For that price, it's pretty awesome. Now, yeah, I know what you're thinking, Patrick, it's been a long time since you've done a high-end switch. And this is actually kind of not even a really high-end switch. It's not even a 32 port, 100 gig ethernet switch. Well, just for that, we have, oh boy, uh, we have this, which will probably be the next switch that we review, which is a 100 gig ethernet Dell switch. And so this is actually the S5200 series. So before you know, we did this video on the S5100 series, we actually have a couple now of the S5200 series and we can go and tear those if you want. Please leave a note in the comments section if you wanna go see inside one of these switches because I think it might be kind of cool just to go and see inside of them because Dell doesn't really publish that. So the basic game plan for today is we're gonna take a look at the hardware, talk about what some of those hardware choices are and why I think that they actually are depressing the price of these switches on the secondary market. And we can also talk a little bit about the next generation that followed and why I think that's actually a better switch. But we're gonna go through the hardware and just kind of talk about some of those aspects. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna talk a little bit about environmentals and you know power consumption, some of the management aspects to it. And then really the software side, which I think is also important. We're gonna talk a little bit about that during the hardware side, but we also wanna just talk about software and why I think they're actually an okay value these days. However, there are also little bits that you may wanna look for and I'm gonna highlight those as well. So with that, let's get over to the hardware. Okay, so let's take a look at the front of the switch because that's probably the easiest part. First thing that you're gonna see is a stacking number, so that's your stack ID. And then what you're gonna see is a total of 48 SFP28 ports. Now SFP28 is what allows you to go run 25 gig ethernet optics or DACs on these ports. But one thing I do wanna just mention really briefly here is that if you have 48 optics and even if you're only paying say $20 per optic, well, that's not necessarily inexpensive itself. You're talking about almost $1,000 just for the optics for the switch. And then, you know, you have the QSFP optics. And so your, your basic thing is that even if you get this switch for in that, you know, maybe $1,400, $1,500 range, you're still gonna spend another over $1,000 most likely on the optics for the switch. So the actual cost of the switch is only part of the equation in this whole thing. I just wanna make sure that everybody has that and keeps that in mind as we're going through this. Now I mentioned that this also has 100 gig ethernet and there are six QSFP 28 ports on the front on the right hand of the chassis. Typically what you would use these for is linking multiple switches together. And so they can be used for stacking or they can be used just to go connect to say a 100 gig ethernet switch. But if you do have a smaller network topology and maybe you only have one or two switches, they could also be used for something as easy as they could actually be 100 gig ethernet connections to say like storage servers or virtualization servers, whatever you need, you actually have some higher speed ports there as well. Now I mentioned the fact already about the optics and we are doing a giant series on ST around fiber optic networking. So definitely check out the STH main site for that. We recently did a video on looking at plenum cable and talking about what plenum cable is. And so you can look at that on YouTube, but for the rest of it, we're probably gonna have most of it on the STH main site, except for maybe the install videos. Aside from the optics though, you can also use DACs and DACs tend to lower the cost of connecting devices significantly. 
We buy a lot of our DAX for maybe $20 or so. So if you're just going inside of a rack using a DAC, which is a you know direct attached copper cable, basically has two ends that are say SFP28 or QSFP28 ends. And you basically just connect those into say your server and your switch. And then you don't have to go buy two optics plus the fiber optic cable that goes between them. They also tend to be lower power. So you tend to have lower power and lower cost. And so that makes DAX a total win if you can use them. Now, this is a very high-end switch, and so we do have hot swap fan modules. If you do get lower-end switches, a lot of times that's a feature that you'll see fixed fans, but in this class of switch, you pretty much have to have a hot swap fan array. Now, on either side of the switch, what you have is redundant 750-watt Dell power supplies. This switch does use a fair amount of power, and it can use several hundred watts, and so it is important that you have you know, a, a power supply that can power the entire switch, and because you also want to make sure that the switch doesn't go down, if power goes down, then you also need redundant power and so it's another area where this really just that is just kind of standard for this class of switch that you have two power supplies and this does now in the middle of the switch we have a couple of features that are in this little block and this little block has a usb port it has a service tag and it also has a serial port and a management port you have a serial port which the serial console is just kind of a standard interface on switches and then you have a management port now this management port can give you one gig ethernet and you can go say run that one gig ethernet and that could be your out of band management to the service processor which is really the rangely processor the intel processor that's on this so the basic idea is that on the front of the switch you have all of the networking ports that are kind of like primary data ports but then on the rear you pretty much have your cooling, you have your power supplies, and you also have all of the management bits that you need that are not kind of directly in that data path. Now again, the whole out-of-band management is just standard on this class of switch, and this kind of configuration is standard. What is not necessarily standard is the fact that these things are on the rear of the chassis. And so I just kind of like it better when like some of this stuff is actually on the front of the chassis. The management port, sure. Serial port, maybe that can be in the back. But in terms of like the USB port and also the service tag, I really kind of wish that those were on the front. Okay, now looking inside the switch, the big heatsink, let's talk about that first because that's kind of what everybody wants to know about. In this switch, the switch chip powering this is the Cavium X Pliant line. Now, a little bit of history here is super important to understand what's going on with this switch. So X Pliant was a Cavium product and Cavium was eventually purchased by Marvell. And then Marvell just recently decided, hey, um, actually, instead of going with kind of X Pliant as our kind of real next gen, high-end infrastructure, what we're gonna do instead, or chip, what we're gonna do instead is we're gonna move to Innovium. So they just purchased Innovium. We did a review and a teardown of a 400 gigabit ethernet, 32 port Innovium switch before they were acquired. And so if you wanna go check that out, that'll be on YouTube. We'll link that in the description as well. But the basic thing here is that if you look at switch chips and just merchant silicon in general for open networking, pretty much Broadcom is the biggest vendor by a long shot. I mean, they're just by far, they're the 800 pound gorilla in the space. So Dell choosing explain here was basically a look at kind of something that, you know, they probably got a deal maybe on and so maybe it's a little bit lower cost. It's still a nice chip, but at the same time, um, you know, it's just not as widely used in the industry. You'll also notice that there's a Celestica board with a micro chip, or actually this is marked micro semi, but now microchip. Uh, they have a ZL3363, and that is a network synchronizer board. Moving behind that, what we actually have is the main management processor board, which basically looks like this because, well, I just pulled it out. First, we have an InnoDisk 16 gigabyte M SATA SSD, and that's really for you know, our network operating system and all that kind of stuff. You also see that there are two memory modules. Maybe to be more clear, there are two memory slots, and these are really designed for DDR3 SO DIMMs. We only have one SODIM installed and that's an eight gigabyte model. I typically don't try to upgrade the memory on these switches because I just don't need it ever. But I guess if you really wanted to, maybe that's something you could look into. Clearly that second SODIM slot is there for a reason. Now you might be thinking to yourself, wait a sec, DDR3, that feels like it's a little bit old. And that brings us to the next most interesting part of this solution, which is really this service processor right here. Now under this little heatsink, what you actually have is an Intel Atom C2000 series Rangely processor. Now at STH, we covered the launch of Rangely. I think that was like in September 2013 or something like that. It is definitely at the very end or towards the end of the embedded product life cycle. Usually you have at least seven years or so. So 
you know, it's 2021, that is definitely an older part at this point. But Rangely was actually famous for another feature or maybe not necessarily good feature. And that specifically was the fact that Rangely had the AVR54 bug. Now, if you don't know what the AVR54 bug is, pretty much the short version is that the Intel Atom C2000 series. So there are two code names. There's Avatun and Rangely. This is Rangely. But the Atom C2000 series, you know, was basically an awesome low power x86 processor that people put in things just like this switch, which you can see here, right? And so there are a lot of companies that design these in. And it wasn't just Dell, by the way. I mean, this was, you know, pretty much everybody. In fact, the actual AVR54 bug was found by Cisco, another networking company, and it specifically caused a lot of angst in the industry. Now on the STH main site, we will link this in the description, but we actually kind of talked about, well, hey, there is this AVR54 bug. And not only is there this AVR54 bug, but in Intel actually made a fund to go help vendors go and fix their products, but it also managed to go and say like, hey vendors, uh, you get access to that money, but only if you don't tell people that it was us that had the issue. And the very high level version of what the AVR54 bug was, was that there was a bug in the silicon that at some point would basically wear out a particular circuit. And then what would happen is you would say reboot your device, whether that was a firewall, a switch, whatever it was, you reboot your device and it would just fail to start up and it would basically brick whatever device that was. So the reason a lot of people may know that is because this caused all kinds of problems. I mean, imagine if you had hundreds of switches, thousands of switches, if they were deployed at edge locations, all the heck over the place. And then you have to go have, you know, your, your switches, your firewalls, all that kind of stuff has to go be replaced as part of a, you know, return process. So that way you can get an updated version that wouldn't just, you know, die at some point. And it was a particularly interesting bug because it didn't necessarily happen in the early life span, but it was really like after maybe like 18 to 36 months that these kind of failures would start to happen. At STH, we actually had a firewall that hit this and we actually have seen it now in two different systems, more from like the 2013, 2014 era. So you know, they are older systems, but at the same time we have definitely seen it. And so the Atom C2000 series has a bit of a reputation as you know, it can cause a lot of headaches when these devices brick. Now on that though, the important thing here is the fact that these switches were actually released, I think in May of 2017. There's a uh, stepping change that came out in April 2017, which would have been before this, but these switches, if you got it like a really early, like May, June one, you probably wouldn't have gotten the new stepping, but you may have gotten something like the rework chip. So we've actually had a couple of these switches running for the last like three and a half years in one of the STH labs. And we haven't seen any issues with them, but we don't have a really big sample size. So I can't tell you like, this is definitely, everything's gonna be 100% fixed. But on the other hand, you know, if you found one that, you know, was produced in something like late 2018 or late 2017, early 2018, something like that, I would think that by then these would definitely all be reworked. And cause nobody, nobody would wanna go and put out a new switch that didn't have the rework at that point because you pretty much knew that you're gonna have a RMA claim on it and it was gonna cost a ton of money to go fix, right? So like, so I, I do think that these switches, even though they have the Atom C2000 series, which used to be like a ticking time bomb if you had an older generation product, these ones actually came out at a period where it was probably after everybody, you know, Dell would definitely have known about it before these came out. And I would just kind of assume that most of these would have either the workaround rework or they would have a new stepping depending on when they came out. But just the fact that it has that explainant switch plus it has this range of thing, I think it's a reason that this is a lot less expensive. One other kind of interesting note here is just the fact that the rear connector on this and how this actually seats into the bottom board is that there's actually kind of a really cool little high density connector here. And one other little tidbit in the event that you're worried like, hey, this is an x86 only switch. The management plane is x86, but you may have seen the fact that there is an ARM processor on here, which is right here. This is an Actel Smart Fusion chip. And just in case this is not the thing that you're gonna be running OS 10 on, the main processor that you're gonna, you know, kind of use for management is the Rangely processor, not this one. So just let's be very clear on that. Now the management board doesn't connect directly to the switch board, instead, the management board actually connects to the board that handles things like the power input. So you have the power, redundant power supplies that go into this power distribution board. And you also have things like the hot swap fans that go into that board as well. Plus all of those management ports, if you remember they're in the rear of the chassis, well, it just happens to be on the same side as the management processor, which sits towards the rear of the chassis as well. 
One thing that I looked at and I was like, wow, that is like, I do not like that design at all is the fact that the battery for this device, which is a CR2032 battery, actually sits below the management board and on that kind of power distribution board. Now, you might be able to get in there and actually go pull it off, but I think most people, if you're gonna go replace that, well, you're probably gonna have to go and actually uh, you know, pull uh, this board off and pull this out so you can actually get into that battery to go replace it. Now, in terms of power consumption, we do have 750 watt power supplies. Uh, realistically, we're running these things in a couple hundred watts. We're not really getting anything under 200 watts by any means, but even with some optics and stuff like that, we tend to be running these in the 400-ish watt range. Uh, so that's kind of just something that you can kind of budget towards, but there's a very wide range depending on you know, how many ports you're using, how much traffic you're passing, what you're doing with the switch chip, uh, you know, if you have optics or DACs and what kind of optics you have. There's a pretty wide range in terms of what you can get in terms of power consumption. So we're going to say maybe go look at the spec sheet, kind of figure out what you think you're going to use in terms of, you know, connectivity and how much you're going to use the switch. And maybe that'll kind of help guide your decisions a little bit better. Now, Dell does not do a really good job in terms of, you know, showing internals of these switches. They do a really good job of even just documenting like what the processor number is or, you know, what the switch chip actually is in these devices. To me, I think that's a total bummer because if you're trying to look up these things after the fact, it's actually kind of hard to figure it out. And if anything, that Atom C2000 AVR54 bug really taught us the fact that it is important to know what kind of chip you have in there, especially if there's some kind of vulnerability or some kind of issue with a set of chips, it's important that you know what you have installed so that way you know if you're impacted by a bug that's found later down the line. So as Dell moves into the open networking era, I really think that it would be awesome if they just started you know, publishing full spec sheets and not leaving that kind of information out. But to me, the number one most interesting part of this is really the reason that I think that this is a much lower cost switch. And I don't necessarily think it's a lower cost switch because just because it's a 2017, like mid 2017 era switch, I actually think that the combination of the Rangely management processor plus the x switch chip is the real reason that this switch costs a lot less than a lot of its contemporaries. And the reason for that is that, well, let's just kind of go look at some of the support pages for two popular network operating systems. So if you didn't want to use Dell OS 10 and you wanted to go use something that was more in line with like other open networking types of, of operating systems, you might go over to Sonic. Sonic is the big open networking thing that uh, a lot of the hyperscalers are doing and a lot of enterprises are looking at it because they're like, hey, this, this is actually uh, something I want to go and deploy. And so when you look at Sonic and you look at the support, you will see that there is a lot of stuff there for the S5200ON, but there is not a S5100ON chip there or switch there. And the reason for that is because this is based on the x -Pliant rather than the Broadcom product. So that switch chip is kind of a big deal. And it's not just Sonic, which would probably be the big operating system that you'd want to run if you didn't want to run OS 10 on this. But also if you were to look at something like Cumulus Linux, well, that is now owned by NVIDIA. And when you go look at that, you also don't see support for the switch. So without being on those very specific hardware compatibility lists, I think that that is a big reason that you don't necessarily see this switch fetching the same price as some of the contemporaries or even just you know the next generation of chips where they where Dell switched from Expliant to Broadcom. But that also might present an opportunity because the switch is readily available, not necessarily super expensive, and you know if you're okay running Dell OS 10 and the switch has a license for Dell OS 10 on it, then maybe it's actually a pretty inexpensive way to get into a fairly high port count, 48 port switch, and also get six 100 gig ethernet ports. If you're thinking like, hey, can I go put this next to my desk at home? Do not do that. This is still a you know, very hot one use switch. It uses a lot of power. It is not something I would wanna go and have next to me. It absolutely screams. But at the same time, I think that if you do have a data closet or maybe you know somewhere at work or something like that where you, know, you might need a very, very low cost 25 or 100 gig ethernet solution, this might be a very good option so long as you're okay running OS 10. But I hope you liked this little teardown of the switch. And if you did, well, why don't you give us a like, click subscribe, turn on those notifications so you can see whenever we come out with great new videos. As always, thanks for watching and have an awesome day.